Hi, everybody. Bob Olson here with Afterlife TV. You can find us at afterlifetv.com. This is where we search for evidence of life after death and ask the meaningful questions around that subject. Uh, there's something very special about this. The man that you see uh, to the side of me is kind of famous. Um, and so one of the things that happened was I heard he had a near-death experience and I couldn't find any information about it. And so I thought, oh, what an opportunity to maybe interview him and ask him about his and maybe some of the lessons that he learned from it. Um, first of all, I'm just going to say you know, most people will know you, uh, will know him by this book, <laughs> The Four Agreements. Very, very famous and popular book. Uh, his name is Don Miguel Ruiz, Dr. M Miguel Ruiz. Thank you so much for joining us today. You know, it's a it's a pleasure, a privilege to be with you and with all your audience. It's great. Oh well, thank you. You know, I will tell you that when I think of you, I just think of um, I just think of how much love you emanate. It, it, that's just the way I think of you. Like you emanate love, and anytime I've ever seen you, that's the way it's been. I saw you actually. You came to Andover, Massachusetts, years ago. I think you were talking about. Um, the book was on the voice of knowledge and uh, it was through uh, a woman named Kathy Levine uh, and her metaphysical store was called uh, Circles of Wisdom at circlesofwisdom.com wonderful lady she had you to Massachusetts and uh, my wife and I went and boy we just enjoyed it so much it was so great to hear you speak that day um, what I want to start off with is if you could just tell us a little bit about your background. You were um, a medical doctor, I know, at the time of your near-death experience. Tell us a little bit about your area of focus um, as far as being a doctor is concerned. Well, uh, I just follow um, family tradition to my, uh, all my brothers, they're doctors. One is a neurosurgeon, the other is an oncologist surgeon. Then, uh, just by following their steps, I also became a surgeon, and I was part of their team. Then, with my brother, uh, Carlos, which is a neurosurgeon, I did a lot of neurosurgery. Wow. Um, and it, it was a, a great time. Uh, but in a certain moment, uh, what I discovered is that most of the people, they, uh, they create their, their own physical problems. And I was very interested to understand the human mind. Yeah. Then I decided to change directions in, in my career. It's not necessarily live uh, medicine. You know, it's one of the greatest art medicine. Yeah. Uh, I just changed the direction into psychology because I really, really want to understand what is going on in the human mind because something that I discovered is that uh, it's so easy to suggest the people. You know, the, the human mind is like a field that is fertile for ideas, for opinions. Then the, depending on whatever is fertile is what will grow in the, in the human mind. Then uh, uh, I just follow the tradition of my family, which is the, the, the Toltec tradition. Mm -hmm. You know, the word Toltec means artist. Then when I talk about Toltecs, I really talking about the entire humanity because we all are artists. Even if we don't have the awareness, we always create him. And the biggest art that we humans create is a story, the story of ourselves, the story of our life. And it looks so real. And we live in that story. Then uh, we accumulate all that knowledge by using the word. We, we, give, we give, give a meaning to every single uh, word that we use. Yeah. And we give our personal power to knowledge. Then knowledge has the need to understand. And knowledge create uh, a masterpiece also, which is the main character of our story which means it create us, the, what we believe we are. And the whole story is based in the main character. But it, it also creates secondary characters that are based in people that really exist. 
because we perceive everyone around us, but what we have in our mind is not the real person, the real people, but the way we perceive them. Yeah. And, and in our story, everybody is just a secondary character. Mm. And what is very interesting is that everybody else, they do exactly the same thing <laughs> that we do. They create their own story, and in their story, they are the main characters, and we are also only a secondary character in everybody else's story. And I, we are completely different in everybody's story, that they really don't know us, and we don't know them. Then knowledge have the need to understand and is so afraid of anything that it doesn't understand. Mm. And this is the main reason why we are, we are so afraid to the unknown, especially to death, yeah. because we don't understand what's happened after the body dies. What a, what a boy. I mean, you said a mouthful there and um, such wisdom in that and in, in everything you just said is kind of mind blowing there for me. Uh, but also the perfect segue to, you know, what we're going to talk about today. And, and I do want to mention, too, that. Um, first of all, I want to congratulate you and, and I'm sure every all the audience does on your Oprah interview. You were brilliant on that. It was beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, it was really, really great. And and you um, had talked about, uh, you know, or she did, you know, vaguely talked about a near-death experience that you had. And I wanted to hear so much more about it. But, of course, that's my passion. You know what I mean? I, <laughs> I love this kind of stuff. And, and, and I'm sure a lot of people in our audience, you know, thought the same thing. And I went online trying to find out more information about it. I couldn't find it anywhere. And so I thought, well, you know, this is a great opportunity to see if he'll be willing to talk to it, talk to us about it um, here on Afterlife TV. So um, have you had more than one near-death experience in your life? Oh, definitely, yes. Okay. It's not, it's not, it's not the first time that it's happened to yeah. me. Okay, all right. And so was the first one the car accident? Do I have that correct? Yes. Okay. All right. So we're talking late 1970s. At least that's what I learned from the <laughs> Oprah show. Is is that yes. correct? It's correct. Uh, I was driving a Volkswagen, mm -hmm. and I make the same mistake that many people do. You know, I drink too much. I used to be the um, a medical student very close to my graduation, and I was in uh, Cuernavaca, that is very close to Mexico City. And being drunk, I decided to drive back to Mexico. Ah. Very bad decision. <laughs> <laughs> then, uh, in a certain moment, I sleep driving the car. Oh. And, and, and the car go directly to a, a, wall con a concrete wall, and the car was total. But what is incredible is that I was out of my body. I see the whole experience. And I see my own body sleeping in the wheel. And what I did is just protect my physical body. Like, like I said before, the car was total. But at that moment, I knew without a doubt that I am not my physical body. Before I, I have the notion, you know, I, I hear so many times, and even I, underst I understood that I'm not the physical body. But from that moment on, it was no longer a theory. For me, it was a fact. Mm. Of course, I don't expect that people believe or not believe that. But for me, it was a fact. I am not the physical body. And of course, that changed my life completely because uh, that pushed me to, uh, to learn even more. Yeah. I, I, I keep uh, going in my training with my mother, my father, my grandfather, because I want to repeat the same, uh, the same experience, but without the, the trauma of, uh, of the accident. Yeah. And it took, it took uh, uh, some time, but I did it again. 
And again, you know, with uh, with my mother, she created a group of uh, th- what she called dreamers. And <clears throat> at first I asked my grandfather, how can I do that uh, uh, again? Mm-hmm. And he told me, you have to renounce to everything. You need to let go all the attachments and for sure you will have the experience. Uh. And I tried to do that and it really didn't work. <laughs> okay. Then I, my grandfather passed and the next on the line was my mother. Mm-hmm. And the explanation of my mother was much easier. And she told me, well, Miguel, it's like when you are so tired that you have to sleep. You really want to sleep. You don't care about anything any longer. Mm. You don't care where you're going to sleep. You don't care if you have family. You don't care if you have business. You just want to sleep. Yeah. And if you are able to do that, you will find out that you will be out of your body again. Mm. And that works. That That's a different approach. Uh, and I can see the difference between the two. Um, can we back up a little bit? So, you know, at the time of your accident, if I understood it right, you were watching your body before the accident was even over. Is that correct? Yes, before the car crash. And even I protect my body. Yeah, and you protect your body. How do you, well, first of all, you know, whereabouts are you when you see, is there a location or do you just see your body? I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm trying to get a vision of this. <laughs> well, I was in the body. Yeah. I was, I, I was inside the car. Yeah, okay. You were inside the car. And I was outside my physical body. Yep. And, you know, time is so relative. Everything was so slow. Yes, yes. That it's time to do whatever. Right. And I just, like, surround my body. And the car, the crash happened. But it, nothing happened to my body. Now, so, obviously, so you believe or you know... Um, that 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 saved your body from harm by oh, doing that. Definitely. Yeah. I have no doubt about it. That's amazing. Um, was there more to it from that point on? Did you did you uh, did you travel further? You know, did you go into a spiritual place at, at all after that, or did you go back into your body? No, I. I... I just uh, was unconscious until my body woke up. Oh, okay. And, and, and you know, <laughs> I, again, I know from that place there's no sense of time, but from where you are now, do you know how much time might have gone by from uh, f- when your body woke up? Well, I, I guess it was several hours. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Wow, okay. Is but- anything happen with you as... Forgive me, because I'm only going to use my own terminology here. <laughs> sure, sure, As a spiritual being, you know, outside your body, um, anything else happened then after the initial accident, after the car has stopped, the body has stopped moving? Well, my whole personality changed. Wow. The way I perceived life was completely different. Yeah. Because uh, before the, that accident... Everything was so important. Yeah. And after the accident, I see everything completely irrelevant. I continue to, to study. I graduate and I start working. But I have a lot of doubts. Okay. Now my, my, the knowledge in my mind want to understand why. Because the first question it was, well, what am I? Okay. Because I am not a physical body, that's obvious. Yeah. And it's obvious that I am not my identity. Yeah. I am not what I believe I am. Right, right. I don't know what I am, and that really scares my knowledge. You know, I see that many other people to have the same kind of experience, Mm -hmm. uh, they start denying what happened. Yeah. They just let go. Right. And they adapt to the, the life and they kind of forget. Mm-hmm. Well, I go exactly in the opposite direction. I really wanted to know. And I want to, to have the same, the same experience. And, uh. even, and even that I was up, uh, <clears throat> I graduated, graduate and I was part of, of the, my brother's team as a surgeon. Yep. 
I really was uh, uh, very interesting to see how the mind works. Because for me, it was obvious a separation between the body, the mind, mm. and what I really am. Yeah. Then I really want to understand the mind because I, I thought that I understand the body completely. And yeah. the body is, is matter. Yes, yes. But the mind is not matter. What would okay? The mind does not matter. What would what would you? How would you define the mind? What would you call the mind? Okay, uh, that's extremely interesting. You know, um, when I went back to to the story uh, of my my legacy, yeah. Uh, when I I have an encounter with what I call the truth. Okay. And that changed my life once again. Okay. You know, we are searching for the truth from millenniums. Yeah. And it looks very complicated because I find out that everybody has his own truth. Right. Okay. And it's not the truth. <laughs> All right. The truth exists. The truth exists long before the creation of humanity and will exist long after the extinction of humanity. That the truth has a need that we believe or not in the truth. Right. And the truth is extremely simple. It's just common sense. And it's just two things. Okay. And we don't even need to prove that exists. The first is life. We don't need to prove that life exists because we all are alive. And of course, Good. our existence proves that life exists. And the other is death, because sooner or later we will die, and we see death all the time. We see people dying, animals dying, and it was so obvious. Yeah. The truth is life and death. It's a, a, benign, uh, uh, a system with, is, uh, with to be, uh, it's a binomium, is or is not, is life and death. And of course, that reminds me my classes of physics, when uh, the teacher says that matter only can move if a force moves matter. Right. And if, and if matter is in movement, only can be stopped if a force stops matter. But matter by itself cannot move. Mm. So the force that moves matter is life. Ah. And matter itself is death. That's beautiful. And, and everything is just an interaction between life and death. Then when I have that encounter with the truth and I see my hands, my hands is dead, is matter. But I move my hands. I see. I am the force that moves my hands. Right, right. And it's life that is moving the hands. That life lives in matter. And matter is alive because life is living in matter. Because life incarnate in matter. Yeah. Then I stood right away that since the moment of my conception, I incarnate in matter. And thanks to me, the very first cells start dividing. And dividing into millions of cells, it shift uh, forms, mm -hmm. takes shape of all the organs. And after nine months of life moving matter, finally a baby was born. Mm -hmm. It started growing up growing old and the moment will come when life leaves matter because it's easy to understand that everything that is being created will have an end but the force which means life is eternal and we see that in science of course Energy cannot be destroyed, only can transform. Hmm. 
He saw obvious the truth. Life and death and everything is moving. If you see an atom, you see all the electrons moving around the nucleus. Right. You see the action between life and death. And it's easy to understand that we live among death. Right. Nature is dead, but it's life who lives in every in every animal, every every vegetable, etc. That is completely uh, understandable that I live in my body and my body is my home. Same like my house is my home, mm -hmm. my city is my home, and finally the entire planet is my home. And also it's easy to understand that the same force moves my body is the force that moves everybody else's body because it's exactly the same thing, it's just life. Life moves the entire manifestation, the entire creation. And this is the big binomial, something that I understood right away that there's only one being and is alive. Mm. Mm. So uh, when we, when, when death comes to any one of us, um, what happens at that point? Do we join all of life again? Like, you know, uh, or do we... You know, is is there still the the singular part of us? Is there still Miguel? Is there still Bob? Um, or does Miguel and Bob leave this body and then just rejoin all of life again? Okay, this is the most interesting part. Okay. Okay. We exist long before our conception. <laughs> right. Because we're life. Okay. Yes. We cannot be destroyed. Then we have to see which point of view we will see. Is the point of view of what we really are, that we call life, but it's just a name. Mm -hmm. Because the truth is that we don't know what we are. Right. That's true. We can use the point of view of the physical body, the one that when we go out will decay and be destroyed mm -hmm. the point of view of the mind and the mind is the reflection of light because we don't see objects we only see light that is being reflected to every single object that we perceive mm -hmm. if you see a mirror it looks like everything that is inside the mirror is real and is full of objects. But it's not true. If you try to touch these objects, you will only touch the surface of the mirror. But everything that is outside the mirror is real. You can touch it, you can weigh it, you can prove that it is real. But everything that is inside the mirror is a virtual reality a copy of what is outside. Mm. When you watch a television and you see any sports that is happening right now in some other place, what you see in the television is a virtual reality. It's not real, but it's based in reality. Well, our mind is exactly the same thing. When you see a mirror, you see a copy of your own mind. The only difference between the mirror and your eyes is that behind your eyes there is a brain. And that brain has everything that you know. And with your reason, you will distort everything. Now, qualify everything that you see. Then from that moment, this is not just a glass cup. You can describe it and write a whole book about cup in the description. Mm -hmm. Right. Whatever you write is not true, but you grab the cup and this is true. Okay, 
the mind is just a reflection of light that the brain perceives and that might create all the knowledge that you have and knowledge create every single thing that you that you think it creates your imagination and with your imagination you go to the infinity because it's a copy of whatever is outside hmm. you go to the infinite when you were in the car accident was that you know and out of your body and looking at your body was that part of the dream too or was that different well obviously it was part of the dream yeah on the dream it was the real me yeah then talk about that is by using what i know in order to make sense of whatever happened yeah right now i know that is not exactly true but it's the only way that the mind can be safe uh, for me what's that what's real all, all that time or that changed already because even that i cannot explain my existence through knowledge i know that i am i exist <coughs> i am alive is what is important mm. and life will be eternal and and that part of the story changed changed your life it changed the way you thought it changed your focus uh from you know from i mean eventually you went from neurosurgery to psychology you know and 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 you've brought up physics many times so i mean obviously that part of the story changed the rest of the story, didn't it? Well, what, what we can see is that you have the experience, but the challenge is to put it in words. Yeah. And not just for yourself, but for everybody to understand. You know, I hear so many times that nobody comes from death. Mm. It's not true. Mm. Uh, right. It's beautiful. Have you ever thought? Have you ever thought about writing a book about death? Oh, definitely. Yeah. It's, it's, in, it's in my schedule, and I'm working in that one. Wonderful. But I take a little more time because I'm very, um, um, very busy right now. Yeah. Yeah. So definitely. Well, I first of all, I appreciate this. You know, one of the one of the things that I've learned. Um, doing these interviews is that sometimes it's good to ask questions and sometimes it's good just to step back and let the person talk because it was just wisdom pouring out of you and I didn't want to interrupt it. So thank you. Um, absolutely beautiful. I, you know, I do want to mention, you know, there, you had, you had even talked about some of the, a lot of these things in the four agreements in the voice of knowledge. Um, even in a couple of them in the four agreements, you talked about heaven on earth and, and that we have the power to create hell and we have the power to create heaven. Um, that was towards the end of the book. I, um, I think that um, you even talked about surrendering to the angel of death, which was which basically is, about detachment, was it not? Exactly. Because uh, our body is already dead. It is always reminding us that sooner or later we will live and detach from that body. Mm. The master dead is to accept it, to embrace it. And that angel of death is really teaching you to live, to be alive. Because from that point, we live our life like perhaps this is the last day of our life but we can plan like a, we will live forever without expecting that whatever we plan will will be real or not. Yeah, yeah. But what will exist is this moment. Yeah. Well, that's true. And, and I think, I mean, you see that with a lot of people who have been diagnosed with a terminal illness or something. You see them make that change in their life, don't you? 
Well, uh, what they should do is just to enjoy their life the best the best they can and not to be afraid to die because they only will leave the body. And, you know, the rest of the people who live around them, they keep that image of them. Mm. Then while they still, in, as a secondary character in everybody else's story, they still alive in their mind. Yeah. Uh, and I was going to ask you if you had a message for the grieving. We have a lot of people in our audience who are grieving. I think you just gave it, really. Did you not? Well, it's, uh, it's, uh, I think it's very interesting. You know, when I have this heart attack, even that it was a very strong pain, I was so excited, <laughs> so happy that that was happening. Because for me, it was the greatest opportunity to share with everyone how to let go of the body, mm. how to detach from the body, to teach them how to die. And first, I called 911. <laughs> that's, that's right. Because I had to defend my life until the last moment. And then I call my manager that I have at that time, it's a Stephanie Bureau. And I ask her to call everybody because they can have the experience to see me how I, I die. But they can understand and stop being afraid to die. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> what I didn't thought at that moment is that in intensive care, they will not allow anybody to go to see me. Oh. Then it was futile to ask everybody. But my middle son, Jose, he came on time. And I had the opportunity to share with him, you know, when he came to see me. Because he's been my apprentice for a long time. He learned a lot already. He was, he was like a 21 years old at that time, something like that. Wow. And when he came to see me, he was full of tears. He was crying. They say, Father, don't die. You don't know, with me. Please don't die. And it was not the Jose that I that I know. Yeah. Then I just stand up and say, Jose, is this is the way that you will celebrate the death of your father? Get out of the room. Fix yourself, and when you're ready, come back, because I need to talk to you before I go. Of course, she was shocked. He never expects something like that. No. And he went out of the room, and a few, mi few minutes later, he came back, and now he was the Jose that I know. <laughs> then he come to me and say, Father, thank you very much, and I apologize to you. I see all my selfishness. I see that I will spend your last moments of your life by feeling sorry for myself. To be so sad because you will die and you are not even die dead yet. And what I did is just, I shift places. Yeah. And I imagine that I was the one who was in the bed dying. And even I went further than that. I really was in the coffin. And I see you crying for me. And I see you to letting go everything that you was doing all those years that you don't want to see anyone. And you just want to be alone, feeling sorry for yourself and decided not to do your work any longer. Mm. See how you were so devastated for my death. And then I have just one minute to talk to you and then I came back and tell you father I am fine I have no pain I am very happy and I don't want to go back then please let me go you are alive then just in the memory for me enjoy your life Enjoy, enjoy every moment of your life. I have my time. I enjoy it. 
Now you do the same with yourself. I say, wow, that is exactly what I wanted to tell you. <laughs> That's yeah. beautiful. Wow. Uh, I'm sure that changed his life to have that experience. And it changed the way he deals with people who are, who are ready to pass, I'm sure. Well, uh, years later, he wrote the fifth agreement. Yeah. Yep. Do I have that one here? I have it. Oh, I gave it away. I gave it away. It didn't come back to me. <laughs> the other books, you know, so I showed the four agreements. Um, and then there's the four agreements companion book. I have the voice of knowledge I did show. Let's just talk a little bit about this, the five levels of attachment. This is this is your son, the one who shares your name with Junior at the end. And um, this is a new book, The Five Levels of Attachment. Tell us a little bit about that. You wrote the foreword to that. Well, uh, after the fifth agreement, in the fifth agreement, you finally win over knowledge. You know, with the fifth agreement, you recover that respect for your, yourself, your own story, and you recover the respect for everyone around you. Yeah. Well, the next step is these five levels of attachment. Because <clears throat> when you become a real master, you have the awareness that you are living in the present moment. And in that present moment, the only way that you deal with everybody else is through attachment and detachment. Then he described five levels of attachment. And, 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 and that what he say is that the majority of us, we are between the third and the fourth level of attachment. And he described it like a flower that when it's completely open, is the first level. You know that you're alive. Then in the second level, it closed a little because you have preference. Because with preference, you enjoy more whatever is around you. When, when you're in the first level, everything is the same. You know your God. You know your everything. You know your life. You know that everybody is God, everybody is life, and there is no difference. When you have preference, then you engage with whatever is happening around you. Okay. In, the, in the third level, now you attach even more, but you are aware that you can let go or you can attach, is attach and detach, and just start attaching to what is happening right now. It's over, you just detach, is the flower start up closing and open. But then at the fourth level, it close even more. And now you identify yourself with whatever is your environment. Now you say, well, I am a medical doctor and everybody should be that way. I'm a vegetarian and this is the way it should be. I'm, I'm a Protestant, and that's the way it should be. I just start uh, trying to convince everybody to be like you, to enroll anybody around you. And the fifth level, the, the flower closed completely, and is fanaticism. You become so fanatic, and in your fanaticism, you lose humanity. You don't care to die for what you believe or to kill for what you believe. Then it's like a, you just have one point and you don't want to see anything else. <clears throat> then when, when you're really a master, you play with that, but with awareness. Yeah. Then it's like a flower that is open and closed and, and is open in so many different directions. Like in some direction is completely open Another direction is completely closed. And, and you know, it's so beautiful how he explained. Yeah. He uses sports in order to, 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 ex to explain those levels of attachment because by using the sports, it's, everything is so easy to understand and it's so irrelevant. But you can see that uh, when we, be, we become fanatic in some sport, we even kill or die because of sport. But when we 
uh, instead of the sport, we're going to religion, into politics, into so many other things. Now we see all the tragedy that happened in, in humanity. Yeah. And I think it's a, a great book that really will help so many people. I think so too. I, uh, here it is again. Um, everybody can pick that up. There'll be a link to it underneath this video. Uh, five Levels of Attachment, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz Jr. Um, the website for you is miguelruiz.com, correct? Correct. So anybody, and th those links will be below as well. Um, links to people can find out things about you uh, and they can learn more about you. I, I, I can't imagine that too many of uh, too many people in our audience don't already have most of your books. Uh, I'm glad we could uh, let them know that about that. You must be so proud of your sons. Uh, you must get to work with them a lot. How wonderful is that, huh? Oh, it's, it's great. You know, uh, we are so close and we love each other so much. And it's just great. Uh, sounds wonderful to me. I mean, uh, that would... Uh, it just seems like the perfect setup, the per perfect system. And, and it's a great compliment to you that they want to go and do that, isn't it? What a wonderful compliment to you. And it's that they really do it in their own way. They, they really don't need me at all. <laughs> That's right. It's cool for just to see them in action. I love it. Yeah, yeah, that is. Uh, that is. Um, well, anyway, so thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ruiz. I really appreciate it. It was such an honor listening to you. And um, uh, I think people are going to want to watch this several times over just to sort of take it all in. But uh, I appreciate it. I hope we get to talk again. Please, let's do, let's do it again. All right. Thank you very much. Very welcome. You have all my love. Yeah, you too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.